Peace be with you. I am Father Joel Aquino. Please join me every Tuesday at 7 in the evening Pacific Time and 10 in the evening Eastern Time for an hour of conversations about Word of God and our Christian mission in relation to the many issues that we are facing today through Servants on Air here at PHLV Radio. Please download the PHLV Radio app from the Apple Store and Google Play where we will have a wide ranging and honest discussions on such topics, especially on Christian faith and relationships. We will also be hearing experiences with God from our brothers and sisters, and hopefully this will enlighten us as to live out our day-to-day Christian life. Verses 20 to 24. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to reproach the towns where the most of his mighty deeds had been done, since they had not repented. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would long ago have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable than Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. As for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? Will you go down to the netherworld? For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and the day of judgment than for you. My dear friends, the Gospel of the Lord. What an act of mercy and love on the part of Jesus. He rebukes those in towns of Chorazin and Bethsaida because he loves them and he sees them and they continue to hold on to their sinful lives even though he has brought them the gospel and performed many mighty deeds and miracles there. They remained obstinate trapped, confused, and unwilling to repent. In this situation, Jesus offers them a wonderful form of mercy. He chastises them. He goes on to say, I tell you, it will be more tolerable than for Tyre and Sodom and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Here, we encounter a wonderful distinction that should help us hear what God may be saying to us at times, as well as help us know how to deal with those around us who habitually sin and cause hurts in our lives and in the lives of other people. The distinction has to do with the motivation of Jesus for chastising them, the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida. Why did he do that? And what was the motivation behind this action from Jesus? With their friends, Jesus chastises them out of love and out of his desire that they may be changed. And they did not immediately repent of their sins 
when he offered an invitation and powerful witness of his miracles. So he needed to take things to a new level. And this new level was strong and clear, rebuking them out of love. This action of Jesus could at first be perceived as an emotional outburst of anger, but that's the key distinction because he was mad and perhaps lost control rather than rebuke them because they needed that rebuke to change. The same truth can be applied to our lives. At times, we change our lives and overcome sin as a result of a gentle invitation from Jesus to His grace. But other times, when we sin, and when we sin that is deep and, and we end up really broken, and torn apart, we need that holy rebuke. In this case, we should hear these words of Jesus as if they were directed to us. This may be specific acts of mercy we need in our lives. It also gives us great insight as to how we deal with others. For example, look at how our parents learn from this. Children will surely regularly go astray in their various ways and will be needing correction. It certainly is proper start with gentle invitation and conversations with them that is aimed in helping them to make things right and that they make right choices. However, at times, this will not work. Sometimes a drastic measure is needed to take place to let the person be awakened out of control, anger and vengeful yelling is not the answer. Yes, we believe that. On the other hand, a holy wrath that comes from God's mercy and love may be the key and helpful. This may come in a form of a strong chastisement or punishment, or it may come in a form of laying down the truth of ourselves and clearly presenting the consequences of our actions. Just remember that even this love and his imitation of Jesus' action, this is what we commonly refer to as a tough love. I invite you today, my dear brothers and sisters, to look at ourselves whether or not we need a rebuke from Jesus. And if you do, let the gospel today of love sink in. Let us reflect upon our responsibility in correcting the misdeeds of other people. Let us not be afraid to exercise these acts of divine love that comes in a form of a clear chastisement. It may just be the key to helping those you love to love God all the more. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful Lord, we thank you for the never-ending love that you have been extending to us. 
Grant us, O oh Lord, the courage to listen to these chastisements, not to condemn us, but to allow us to see and evaluate ourselves, who we are, and how we can possibly change ourselves to become a better people. Enlighten us. Lead us to the path of justice and mercy. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel is one of those feast days in the church that we all celebrate on July 16th, but often without knowing why. Perhaps some of the more devotional Catholics know about the brown scapular and the vision of St. Simon Stock, but often that's where it ends. I have to admit that even when I became a Carmelite, I struggled to understand the significance of this feast day and what this title represents. I hope that this video will lead to seeing more clearly the significance of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and the powerful way she leads us to intimate union with God. First, I'll speak of the history, and then I'll look a little at the theology, and we'll conclude with ways of implementing this devotion to Our Lady of Mount Carmel in our, in our everyday lives. And first, just with some history, you know, to understand Our Lady of Mount Carmel, we first must glance at the story of the Carmelites. We know that around the time of the Latin Kingdom in the Holy Land in the late 12th and early 13th century, crusaders, pilgrims, and penitents began gathering on Mount Carmel to live an eremitical yet communal life of prayer. And this place was already famous because of the Old Testament presence of the prophet Elijah in his contest with the prophets of Baal, when he called down fire from heaven, and then the famous vision of the small cloud which ended the long drought that we see in 1 Kings chapter 18. The church fathers and medieval spiritual writers saw in this image of the cloud and in the other scriptural references to Mount Carmel a foreshadowing of the Virgin Mary. So there was already a strong sense of a Marian presence, which meant that Our Lady was kind of the environment, the, the air, if you will, that the first Carmelite hermits breathed. Her presence became the most helpful environment for union with God. It's interesting that even though Elijah had the most clear connection with Mount Carmel, and the early Carmelite hermits saw themselves as his spiritual children, yet they chose to dedicate their first chapel not to him, but to the Virgin Mary. And this choice had enormous consequences. It meant that she was the lady, the queen of their young group. In the feudal mentality of the time, the lady of the manor or the place, she was the leader. It meant that everything belonged to her, and she would then be responsible for taking care of, of her religious, of her hermits. And this mentality is reflected in the choice of the hermits to take on Mary as patroness. It means that they consecrated themselves to her way before that this was a common practice. We know that Carmelites had no kind of one founder, no one saint that they could point to from whom their, their charism, their mission flowed. They did consider Elijah their spiritual father, but he was seen as the co-founder. Mary was the main foundress and inspiration of this little group. From this intuition came the tradition that Elijah himself began the Carmelites because of his vision of Mary in the little cloud. Since she was the reason and purpose of the group, she then also became its founder. Soon Mary became part of the Carmelites' title as well. The Carmelites were officially known as the Brothers of the Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. So Mary was already their lady, their queen, and their mother. But this title meant that she was also their sister. This closeness is there. This, the one whom they looked to as their model and helper in order to live in allegiance to Jesus Christ, as the Carmelite rule states. All was for Jesus, and it was in and through Mary. So this maternal protection of Our Lady manifested itself early in the many concrete instances where she intervened to save her young Carmelite order. Before the Christian kingdom fully lost the Holy Land, some Carmelites had already come to Europe to make foundations in order to, to survive. But what they, found, what they found in Europe was misunderstanding and even hostility. In that time, the church was suppressing many new orders because it seemed that there were too many. It looked likely that the Carmelites too might become disbanded. But certain key moments occurred when, against all the odds, 
popes and ecumenical councils decided in their favor. The Carmelites attributed these, these almost miraculous moments of survival to the help and protection of Our Lady. And this is also the significance of, of the brown scapular, you know, as we see here, the, all, that all Carmelites wear. The tradition is that St. Simon Stock, one of the early prior generals, was praying because of all the dangers facing the order, threatening its existence. He was begging Our Lady for some pledge of her protection. In his prayer of agony, she appeared to him and presented the brown scapular, saying, This shall be the privilege for you and for all the Carmelites, that anyone dying in this habit shall be saved. This became the sign that Mary would personally make sure that anyone who faithfully persevered in her service as a Carmelite would never be lost. As time went on, others, especially lay people, wanted to share in this grace of the Carmelites. And so this developed into the wearing of the little scapular to share in this promise of the protection and mercy of, Mar of Our Lady. And we can see the, the little scapular here. You know, and the tradition is too that, that the Carmelites would cut, you know, a little part of their own scapular to share it with others. And so, yeah, so it's two-sided as you see the scapular. July 16th became the day dedicated to the recognition and gratitude of all the ways that Mary had come through for the Carmelites. And the brown scapular is a great sign of this, of this protection, of this help in the moments when all seemed lost and they needed it the most. And so in terms of theology or the way that we explain kind of Our Lady of Mount Carmel in our Christian faith, she shows us the essence of who Mary is for Carmelites, but for all believers. She is the, we call her the Queen of Carmel, but her queenship is not in this distant sense of a, you know, dignified royalty who knew little of, uh, who, who knows little of actual human misery. Rather, Mary's queenship is exercised in and through her maternity and closeness to us. She is the mother of mercy, and she comes to our help in the, in our greatest moment of need. And this is not simply limited to like the last things, you know, at that moment of, of, of passing to the next life, but it goes throughout all of our spiritual lives. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas, he devi defines divine mercy as the love of God that reaches down into our misery and lifts us up. Love that reaches into misery and lifts it up. This is fully evident in the way that God works in our interior life. God's love reaches into the personal misery of our disorders, our inner poverty, our struggles, our sinfulness, and He purifies us and He transforms us in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit desires to carry out this work through Mary's intercession and her maternal love for us, even in this life. And so we know that the octave is eight days from the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel until the 23rd, ends with the Carmelite Feast of Our Lady of Divine Grace. This celebrates the teaching of Mary as our spiritual mother, through whom God gives us His grace. As God used Mary to come into this world in Jesus, every good thing, in a sense, came through her in Christ. And so God continues to give us every good thing through her intercession in heaven. We know that God does not discard His instruments. The mission that He gives continues and bears great fruit. For an analogy of this, we can look to St. Therese, St. Therese of Lisieux. She was a, a powerful intercessor as a nun, and she experienced a unique divine call to this, a vocation to this. And before she died, she received a presentiment that she would spend her heaven doing good on earth, carrying on this vocation that she had already received in this life. And we can see that St. Therese is now one of the most powerful heavenly intercessors that God has given to the world. And so all the more then is this true with Mary. She was predestined for this universal mission from all eternity. We can see it being fulfilled in her assumption into heaven and in her queenship at the right hand of her son. Our Lady of Mount Carmel can be seen as the model also for our Carmelite teachers of the spiritual life. It is truly through Mary's inspiration that our Carmelite saints have developed the spirituality that has so impacted the church. St. Teresa of Avila mentions Mary's presence as a special help for those beginning the journey through the interior castle. One must invoke her aid constantly to have the strength to make those first steps away from sin and towards Jesus. 
but that this continues through all of the mansions of the interior castle. And also St. Teresa's own role as reformer and foundress went hand in hand with her experience of mystical Marian graces that she especially had on the Feast of the Assumption, August 15th. St. Teresa experienced Our Lady clothing her with her own holiness and gave Teresa a pectoral cross as a sign of sharing in Mary's own maternal authority in the Order of Carmel. In St. Teresa of Avila, the Discalced Carmelites have a window into seeing Mary continue her maternal guidance of the Order. St. John of the Cross looks at Mary as the model of advancing towards union with God. He mentions her in, hers, in his description of the purification of the interior life, when the Holy Spirit progressively takes over our life and so cleanses us from our attachment to things that aren't God, to creatures that aren't God. He writes, he writes about this connection to Mary. Such was the prayer and work of Our Lady, the most glorious virgin. Raised from the beginning to this high state of union with God, she never had the form of any creature impressed in her soul, nor was she moved by any, for she was always moved by the Holy Spirit. It's the words of St. John of the Cross from his ascent of Mount Carmel. This being moved solely by the Holy Spirit is the goal for the entire spiritual life. And St. John of the Cross saw this goal above all in Mary. St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face, shows us the tremendous insight she had into Mary's role also, saying that she is more mother than queen. This was so key for Therese. She is more mother than queen. And that one need only look to the Gospels to get a comprehensive picture of Mary, the perfect disciple, growing in faith through ordinary circumstances just like us. One could say that St. Therese's little way is a close reflection of how Our Lady lived faith, hope, and charity in this world. Carmelite spirituality could be defined as prayer, intimacy, and union with God as the absolute goal for each moment of every day. And this is completely embodied in the Virgin Mary. And so the saints of the Carmelite order constantly radiate the Virgin Mary in their lives and teachings. And so, now that we've kind of looked at the spirituality, theology, what's maybe a practical aspect? How do we, how do people respond to this gift that God has given us in Our Lady of Mount Carmel? Well, first and foremost, we know that it has led thousands of men and women to make their lives a complete offering of self in the Carmelite order as friars, as nuns, and third order, or also known as secular Carmelites. But this gift of self, this gift of Our Lady is not just for Carmelites but for all who want to draw near to Jesus through Mary, especially through the brown scapular. It's a very simple sign of this desire, and many can attest to the power and protection that the scapular has brought them. Their desire to give themselves fully to Jesus through Mary is a fruit of, of their experience of the scapular. And so, so now the question, how can we apply this teaching in our prayer? Well, for one, we can invite Mary into our interior life into our life of prayer, and into our desire even for union with God, that she will intercede so that the Holy Spirit will completely possess us and guide all of our acts, just like the Holy Spirit guided her. Our Lady can also be the guide that will redirect me if I'm going in a wrong direction. Mary will illumine my path and obtain the grace I need in the moment I need it, when all may even seem lost. And again, the scapular is a powerful reminder of this truth. In ministry, also Our Lady of Mount Carmel can be an awesome introduction to Carmelite spirituality and, and the scapular. What is, you know, this mysterious title? What is this mysterious little cloth that seems to promise so much? Many have stumbled upon our Carmelite saints simply through devotion to Our Lady and wearing the scapular, as, especially as a beginning. It plants a, a deep seed. And often this eventually grows and leads them into the adventure of making union with God the main goal of our life. Others can see in Our Lady of Mount Carmel and her scapular a devotion that doesn't demand too many external rituals, but is simply a silent prayer. And this shows that silent prayer is a great way to honor Mary. Also the image of a, of a mother clothing her little child with the scapular, it's a powerful one for us. Every time we put on the scapular, we can be reminded that Mary is truly clothing us with her own virtues and holiness. 
The scapular has always represented the assistance of Mary when we're in danger. It teaches that we can have a total trust in her protection. For those in the thick of the battle with sin, it is a reminder that through her hands will also flow the mercy of God, that she is the refuge of sinners. We can trust that she will obtain for us all we need to reach intimate union with God if we hope in the mercy of Jesus and don't rely on ourselves. In short, kind of in conclusion, Our Lady of Mount Carmel is not simply one other title of Mary. It is a whole history of a relationship. It is Mary who protects her children, who leads them to deep intimacy with Jesus Christ, and who will always be there to rescue them when they need it the most. The Virgin of Mount Carmel invites us into into a spirituality of the interior life embodied so much in our Carmelite saints. And again, this is not just for Carmelites, but this is for all people. All are meant to share in this great gift of Mary's love and guidance in the spiritual life. And this is what we celebrate on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. My dear friends, brothers and sisters, let us now offer the different petitions we hold in our hearts as we pray before the Blessed Sacrament and and mindful of the chaplet of the Divine Mercy, we bring to the Lord our needs, our continuing petitions for healing. Let us all remember the members of our communities and families who are ill and sick. May God touch them today in a very special way. Also, we include in our petition all the souls in purgatory, the many people who have died because of the pandemic, and all the forgotten souls. May God grant them eternal rest. Also, we pray that may our lives be transformed. We pray for our own conversion and healing. And for those prayer petitions we hold in our thoughts and in our hearts, we ask the Lord to listen to them and to grant them In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You died, Jesus, but the source of life flowed out for souls. In the ocean of mercy, open up for the whole world. O fountain of life, immeasurable divine mercy, cover the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, It's a fountain of mercy for us. We trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, it's a fountain of mercy for us. We trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, it's a fountain of mercy for us. We trust in you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. 
for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and of the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and of the whole world. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, 
mercy on us in the known world for the sake of the sorrowful passion have mercy on us in the known world. Eternal Father, we offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and of the whole world. Amen. Jesus, King of mercy, we trust in you. The Lord be with you. And may the Almighty God bless you and your families, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. I am Father Joel Aquino. Please join me every Tuesday at 7 in the evening Pacific Time and 10 in the evening Eastern Time for an hour of conversations about Word of God and our Christian mission in relation to the many issues that we are facing today through Servants on Air here at PHLV Radio. Please download the PHLV Radio app from the Apple Store and Google Play where we will have a wide ranging and honest discussions on such topics, especially on Christian faith and relationships. We will also be hearing experiences with God from our brothers and sisters, and hopefully this will enlighten us as to live out our day-to-day -day Christian life. Dear friends, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us in our program tonight. And let us remember that this week we will be celebrating that uh, memorial feast of the Blessed Lady of Mount Carmel. Let us offer to the Lord with the session of the Blessed Virgin Mary the many petitions we continue to lift up to God these needs of our family and community. And may we truly venerate the Blessed Virgin Mary, our mother, and that veneration will also uh, enrich our relationship with the Lord. Have a wonderful night and God bless you. See you next week. Bye now.